Hi everyone, this is Mr. Sinti, and this lesson is going to begin with a discussion of a few different organelles. And the first one that I want to talk about is the lysosome. And the lysosome is an organelle of digestion, but just like our previous discussion, I don't want to just go into an explanation of like this is a lysosome and this is what it does. I could, but I want to sort of go about it as a um, a solution to a problem that some cells have. And so in this diagram or picture, you can see here, it sort of looks like some sort of creature from the movie The Matrix. This big purpley looking thing with tentacles is a cartoon drawing of a white blood cell. And this is in the blood. And what these sort of yellow guys are are bacteria. And one of the things that a white blood cell can do is reach out with its membrane. That's what this is. And remember the membrane's fluid. It can reach out with its membrane and sort of lasso bacteria and pull them in, sort of like harness them like a like a fish on a on a line. It pulls them in and it eats them. And that's how it they destroy bacteria. But there's more to that discussion. Like for example, if this is a uh, picture of the blood, let's just do here, like a blood vessel. And say uh, an unwanted bacteria is inside the, uh, the blood, and so our white blood cell is going to take care of it. And so along comes our white blood cell, and the way I'm drawing it, I'm going to emphasize the fact that the cell membrane or plasma membrane is fluid. And so what the cell can do is it's mobile. It could sort of extend its membrane around what it is interested in eating. And when early biologists first observed this under the microscope, they sort of described these extensions of the cell membrane that we saw in the previous picture like, like tentacles. They called these pseudopodia or false feet. It's kind of like stretching out like this. And what would happen is when the membrane stretches out like this, um, what, what occurs is let me sort of illustrate this, is that when these two sides touch each other, go back here, what can happen is, just like what we saw before, when something's exiting the cell, something can enter the cell that's really large. And so this is a process called uh, endocytosis. Endocytosis. It, it used to be called phagocytosis. Uh, again, the, that's a Greek word meaning to eat or cellular eating. But I like the, the term endocytosis. It's taking in something really huge. Now, let me remind you of something that you may already know. Something large like this is not going to be able to pass through the cell membrane. Even through a protein, it's not going to be able to pass through. So a white blood cell would have no way of, of eating this bacteria if it wasn't through this process of reaching out and grabbing it with its cell membrane. You might be thinking, well, why doesn't the white blood cell like produce an enzyme for digestion and close it in a transport vesicle and then secrete that to the outside and then have the enzyme digest the bacteria? That's a possibility. That's what our digestive cells do. We they secrete enzymes and digest large polymers into monomers so that we can absorb them. But I'm sorry, bacteria are not going to sit around and wait for a white blood cell to excrete an enzyme to digest it. It has to take an active role. So the white blood cell is out there and it's like eating big things. Now, here's the problem though. I, I said that there was a problem with this. Once you take in something really large, like a bacteria through endocytosis, it's, it's enclosed in this vesicle. Now this, this is no longer called a transport vesicle. This is something called a food vacuole. It still needs to be digested. I mean, you can't have something very large like this. Like bacteria, I, I know it's a prokaryote, but it still has ribosomes, it still has starch, it has proteins, it has nucleic acids. It must be broken down for the white blood cell to deal with it. So here's the solution. Inside the white blood cell, there's numerous little organelles called lysosomes. Let me just go like that. It's lysosomes. And, whoops, whoops, I didn't 
want to do that. <laughs> um, all right, that's good. Ooh, lysosomes. <laughs> I don't know what I pushed. <laughs> Hope I don't push it again. So lysosome is the name of these organelles, and there's, there's many of them. What, what does the word mean if we were to break it down? The word lyso means to split. And we've seen this before in hydrolysis. And so what's, I'm going to write that down, hydrolysis, because hydrolysis reactions are what occur inside the lysosome. So some means body. So it's these hydrolytic sites where, like, what's in them? What's going on? What, what is this thing? It's a just a simple circle or like a little sack, and what's inside are these little enzymes, these little hydrolytic enzymes. And what happens is when the bacteria or food vacuole comes in contact with the lysosome, if I can animate this maybe, just extend it like this, like that. And so when these two things come in contact with one another, what's going to happen is these vesicles are going to fuse together and the enzymes are going to come over here and break down the bacteria into little tiny monomers. And when these little monomers are small enough, they're then going to simply diffuse out of the lysosome and the white blood cell is going to be able to digest it. So the lysosome, very simply stated, is like the stomach of the cell. It's a digestive organelle that breaks down big molecules into small ones. But uh, what can be confusing to some students is that it's like, well, why would you need a stomach when I thought the point was to release digestive enzymes to break things down small enough so that they enter the cell? Yes, this is what most cells do. But a white blood cell, now that's a human white blood cell, but even single-celled organisms like protists, something like amoeba, something that's floating in a lake needs to eat like this as well. Something that's chasing a prey is not going to be able to release digestive enzymes with the hope that it's going to break down the food and then it will be absorbed. Cells have to actively go out there and grab through phagocytosis, grab the food, and then once it comes in, it's up to the lysosome to break it down. And so let's take a look at this process. Uh, if I can erase this. So this is back to our original slide of a white blood cell like grabbing uh, some bacteria. So what's going to happen here is lysosomes are the digestive components of the cell. Now they don't look very glamorous. These are lysosomes right here in black. There's the nucleus. They look like just circles with dark. But they're membrane bound and what do they, what do they contain? Hydrolytic enzymes and those are just proteins that are speeding up hydrolysis reactions. In other words, breaking polymers down into monomers. You could ask this question, how did the lysosome get those hydrolytic enzymes in the first place? And that, that would be a very good question. Let's, let's answer that question. So if you have a cell like this, and here's the lysosome, and you're like, well, how did the, how did the enzyme get in there in the first place? And you're like, wow, I know that enzymes are made on ribosomes. So here's a ribosome. And you're like, oh yeah? So if I make a protein, like an enzyme, it's like, yes, this one goes to the lysosome. Oh, no, it doesn't, because the membrane isn't going to allow a protein to pe penetrate. So what the cell needs to do, this is a little review, it needs to produce that protein on rough endoplasmic reticulum, yes. And so when the protein enzyme is produced inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum, when it buds off, let me sort of move forward here and show that, when it buds off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's enclosed in a membrane, like so, and it's like, all right, but how does the cell know? Is, am I supposed to leave the cell, or am I supposed to go to the lysosome and you may know the answer to this. There's another organelle involved. This is still review. There's another organelle called the Golgi. There it is right there. The Golgi. The Golgi body. 
And what the Golgi body does is it takes in this transport vesicle with the hydrolytic enzyme in it. There's an enzyme. And what does it do? It labels it with little sugars. The truth is, the sugars are actually placed on the inside of the membrane. And then when it buds off, if you can imagine this, this is maybe more of the truth than you really want. When it buds off from the Golgi apparatus, then the sugars would actually be on the outside. And so what happens is this sugar on the outside tells the cell, am I supposed to leave? The answer is no. Am I supposed to go to the lysosome? The answer is yes in this case. And so it travels over here, and when the one vesicle buds with another vesicle, in this case a lysosome, the hydrolytic enzyme is therefore deposited inside the lysosome, and now you're good to go. So there's a lysosome, lysosome with hydrolytic enzymes that were produced by rough endoplasmic reticulum. You're like, oh, awesome. So now when the cell, check this out, when the cell reaches out its membrane, there it is reaching out its cell membrane like this, and it's eating something, let's say it's eating a red bacteria. When it eats a red bacteria like this, it's going to take it in through uh, endocytosis, but it still needs to be digested. This is then going to fuse with the lysosome, and when it fuses with the lysosome, you guessed it, the membranes fuse together like this, and the hydrolytic enzyme comes over here and it breaks down the bacteria into little tiny monomers, and then that actually is able to exit the lysosome and then here's the kicker. The white blood cell is then able to use the amino acids of the bacteria and the sugars of the bacteria and the DNA from the bacteria to do its own thing. You can actually use the amino acids from the bacteria to produce future enzymes to help break down further bacteria. It's pretty interesting. So um, that's what I wanted to say about the lysosome uh, in that context. And so they're very powerful stomachs. And so this is a cool picture right here. This is an actual photograph. Yes, it's an electron microscope and it is a transmission electron microscope. It's showing the membrane, look how fluid it is, the membrane of a white blood cell grabbing a bacteria through phagocytosis or endocytosis and it's pulling it in, it's pulling it in. So What's going to happen is, let's say, this is obviously an animation of this or, or cartoon drawing, I should say. These are Say this is many bacteria and this is the membrane of a white blood cell and this is over time. It reaches out with its membrane, it grabs the bacteria, it pulls them in, and oh, look, it now has them inside. But these things need to be further digested. So you're like, ah, oh, what's going to happen? Well, this is then going to fuse with a, yes lysosome, and the lysosome has inside of it hydrolytic enzymes that will break that down and the cell will be able to eat. And that sounds very good. So let's see here. So the lysosomal enzymes can break down anything. They can break down protein, fat, polysaccharides, nucleic acids, that's DNA and RNA. And so what happens is when something's taken in like this, it's considered to be uh, once it breaks down in the lysosome, it's considered to be like a food vacuole, and then all this goodness can come out. Here's a picture of the Golgi apparatus. Here's the picture of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Here's the nucleus. Here's the cytoplasm. These are the free ribosomes over here. This is a little organelle that we're, we're coming to called the mighty mitochondria. So this is a cool schematic sort of showing like a progression of things. So here's a cell reaching out, grabbing the food in through phagocytosis. Then it's considered to be a food vacuole. And then, oh, look, it fuses with a lysosome. And then whatever that green thing was, maybe it was algae, it's broken down into its small components and then these things diffuse. You're like, okay, I got it. You're like, all right. So what's happening over here? Just a little detail of this 
process, sometimes our organelles get old. Like for example, here's a mitochondria that looks like it's not functioning properly. What's interesting is our cells sort of can use a lysosome to recycle, you know, just like a, a can, an aluminum can that we no longer need anymore. We can recycle it and melt it down and then the aluminum can be reused again. Sometimes a lysosome will fuse with a, an organelle that isn't working and actually break it down and then its components are, are recycled and can be used to manufacture something else. It's referred to as auto, which means self uh, Fagy. <laughs> it's a weird word. In other words, like self-eating. <laughs> uh, that's a translation, but at least as far as I know. Um, so again, the lysosome, this is funny. This is an actual picture of what we were just talking about. This is a lysosome in action. It's actually eating some kind of uh, a fragment of a mitochondria right there. This is another organelle that it's eating called the peroxisome. So lysosomes can fuse with food vacuoles and break them down. And so that, that, that's kind of interesting. And so speaking of vacuoles, vacuoles, you may know this term from somewhere in your past. Vacuoles can be sort of temporary and they can be permanent. Um, plants usually have the largest vacuoles of all. And it's something called the central vacuole. It's sort of like an indoor swimming pool. When you look at a typical plant cell, you see this giant circle, it's a big membrane with, filled with water. And the plant needs lots of water, as, as, as you may know. It takes water in and it stores it in there, and it, it's responsible for providing pressure for the plant. But it's not just water for pressure. It needs water for photosynthesis, and it also, plants can store toxic compounds in their central vacuole, uh, for example, if they're poisonous. Or they can have other little pigments in there to give the plant color. So they're, they're useful in many ways. A food vacuole we talked about, and this thing called the contractile vacuole is interesting. It's usually found in a little guy, like protus, little tiny, like for example, paramecium. The thing about paramecium, that when it live, when you live in a lake, uh, you're, <laughs> there's a lot of harshness in a lake. And one of the things that you're dealing with is the fact that water is constantly going into the cell because there's all kinds of solute. It's a hypertonic environment inside the cell. You're like, well, what are you going to do? Well, there's no wall, so all these protists are in danger of blowing up <laughs> by osmosis. And so what, what they've evolved is this little tiny vacuole that collects water, and it sort of looks like a little star like this. It's got these little strings on it of protein. And when this fills up with water, it pulls on the strings, sort of like a purse string. When you pull on it, it squeezes the water back out again. It's rather clever. And that's called a contractile vacuole. All right. Let's continue our discussion of these organelles as we move through. And so, again, I mentioned the function of the, of the central vacuole in a plant is it stores pigments. It can have some defensive compounds in it. And uh, basically, it's a big reservoir of water. And this is a cool picture of the transmission electron microscope. You can see the central vacuole is kind of huge. Uh, cytoplasms over here. These are the green chloroplasts, although the picture is in black and white. These would be green. Here's the nucleus. This word tonoplast is a term that's not as important. It's uh, describing the membrane of the central vacuole. So speaking of mitochondria and chloroplasts, let's look at them. The mitochondria is the site of cell respiration and the chloroplast is the site of photosynthesis, not only in land plants, but in algae and bacteria as well. But in this case, when we talk about photosynthesis and a chloroplast, this is a big organelle. It really is only found in eukaryotic cells and so not in as I, I may have misspoken on that, it's not found in bacteria. It's found in eukaryotic cells to chloroplasts. And so let me go over here and sort of diagram what's happening in a typical cell. If you had a cell like this, let's say that it is a plant cell. So here's the membrane. And let's go something like this for the cell wall, rigid 
cellulose cell wall. This is supposed to be on the outside if I was able to draw that correctly. And then inside we have this big giant green chloroplast. And then inside the cell also we have this little tiny mitochondria. Draw it like this. Now what's happening is, you may know this from previous discussions, but when the, when the sun comes down in photosynthesis, it strikes, this is the sun, it strikes the chloroplast, and what the chloroplast is capable of doing is photosynthesis, which means what's it making? It's making oxygen, and it's synthesizing glucose. So let's just go like this for a carbohydrate. So these two things, sugar and oxygen, are then taken in to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the site of cell respiration. And what we mean by cell respiration is that the oxygen reacts with the sugar inside and it produces carbon dioxide and water. These are the waste products of cell respiration. This is what we breathe out when we respire. Oh, curiously, the chloroplast uses carbon dioxide and water to make oxygen and sugar. So as you can see, plants have a little cycle going on here. So they're autotrophic. They make their own food and then they consume their own food through cell respiration. It's rather impressive. You know, animal cells, on the other hand, are kind of, you know, left out there without a chloroplast. So we have just the mitochondria. And you're like, well, this is pretty good, but it's like, how are we going to get the food? Where is it going to come from? And you're like, oh, I thought glucose was found in our blood, but we had to eat that. So ultimately, we're reliant on the plants. We're consumers. We have to eat the glucose that the plants produce in photosynthesis. And then we, glucose then travels into the cell, goes into the mitochondria. And so here's our glucose going into the mitochondria. This is our carbohydrate. And then what happens? We have oxygen coming from the blood as well, red blood cell. And so oxygen goes into the mitochondria. And what do we breathe out? Carbon dioxide and water. And then these things are then released back into the blood. And what's the point? Uh, the point is that the sugar is burned for energy. So cell respiration gives organisms energy. So let's go back to the desktop in the slideshow. And so chloroplast, photosynthesis, cell respiration, and the mitochondria. And so both the mitochondria and chloroplasts are not part of the endomembrane system, but they do possess internally a lot of membrane. They also possess, curiously, their own ribosomes and their own DNA, which is extremely suggestive of the fact that these organelles were once free living many billions of years ago. And I'm going to come back to that, that thought. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very curious one uh, about uh, during our evolution unit. So here's the mitochondria. It has lots of inner convoluted membrane, and it's associated with aerobic cell respiration, which means with oxygen. This is a picture electron microscope of an actual mitochondria. You can see its inner membrane called the Christi. And then this middle area is called the mitochondrial matrix. Um, that's where the DNA is. And that's where some ribosomes are and some enzymes. If you were to take AP biology, we spent a lot of time looking at the, the chemical reactions of cell respiration. Again, finally, here's a picture of the outer membrane and the inner membrane is very convoluted called the Christi, and then this inner part is called the matrix, and it's the site of cell respiration. The chloroplast uh, is only one type of plastid. It's a colored plastid that is green because it contains the pigment chlorophyll. So the pigment is something that picks up rays from the sun and are able to convert the energy of the sun into the energy of sugar, like glucose. There are other plastids, which are these big organelles that are not necessarily green. There's some clear ones called amyloplasts that store starch in roots. Um, and there's some other colored ones that give petals different colors uh, and flowers. But the most conspicuous plastid of all is indeed the chloroplast. You can see it here. 
uh, they're green, they're just jumping out. What do they do? They photosynthesize. And so inside the chloroplast, you have an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then you got like these stacks of green discs called the thylakoids. And these thylakoids are where the light is picked up. And then this matrix over here called the stroma is actually where glucose is produced. Again, the details of photosynthesis will be discussed in AP Biology if you're interested. They also have DNA and ribosomes. So pretty cool. And so um, cartoon drawing of a chloroplast, uh, actual transmission electron micrograph. If you were to color these stacks of granum, these would be green because of the chlorophyll. And so this might be familiar. This is a typical Elidea uh, leaf. Notice you can see chloroplasts, but you cannot see the mitochondria because those are very, very small. And so they're in there, though, because plants have both. And so finally, here's a picture of typical plant cell that has chloroplasts. And you're like, what's this clear area right there? That's the large central vacuole. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion of lysosomes, uh, mitochondria, and the chloroplasts. Thanks for watching.